<laughs> How's that for a walk-up music? <laughs> Recognize that tune, many of you? How many of you brings back instant memories, yeah? Uh, shall we sing it together? I feel like, we, we're, like we're obligated now, <laughs> right? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. You know it, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be? Oh, it's on the screen. <laughs> All right, that's enough of that. I'll stop now. It's a limit of my ability to carry a tune. But it does bring back memories, doesn't it? Singing that song for some of us. I found out I, uh, that, that this is, uh, some people didn't grow up with Mr. Rogers, and that there's a difference between those who like Sesame Street and those who like Mr. Rogers. Uh, I never liked Mr. Rogers as a kid. I thought he was a little weird, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'd like him now. But when I was a kid, it was too slow. I like Sesame Street, you know, it was moving faster. But Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, no doubt, had a profound impact on our culture. On, on, on generations. Did you know that his red cardigan, you'll see an image of him here, his famous red cardigan sweater is in the Smithsonian? That's crazy to me. I tried to find a, a red cardigan uh, yesterday to wear, but anyway, <laughs> fortunately, I didn't find one. And there's a new generation learning about the, uh, the message of Fred Rogers called Daniel Tiger. I didn't know about this. Some of the younger parents on our staff said, oh, yeah, Daniel Tiger. And by the way, can we agree that the animated tiger looks way better than that ratty puppet that Fred Rogers used to use? By all accounts, Fred Rogers was a remarkable human being, he was an ordained Presbyterian minister who made an impact in this world through a simple yet transformational message in a kid's show. What was that message? You could phrase it lots of ways. But love, love people, love each other, love your neighbor. Where did he get this message? Where did he come up with this transformational message that shaped generations of children and many of you in the room? I, I wonder where he got it. I mean, did he sit down in his red cardigan sweater and take his shoes off and think about it, think something up? It won't shock you to know, and he, Fred would tell you if he was alive, that he got it from Jesus. This is not unique to PBS or WTTW if you grew up in Chicagoland. He got it to G from Jesus. And over the next four weeks, we're going to examine the biblical foundations of Jesus' transformational message of love for neighbor. What does that look like? What does that mean really in our lives? The actual teaching of Jesus on this is known as the great commandment, the command to love your neighbor. It's not the great suggestion. It's not the great idea. It's not the great philosophy, it's the great commandment. What do you do with the commandment? I command you, right? You either, you got, really got two options. You obey it or you don't. Many of us treat it like it's a suggestion or an idea or a philosophy or advice, but it's the great commandment. And there are several places in the Gospels where Jesus makes this specific command clear. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. In fact, I saw just yesterday Drew Brees, quarterback for the New Orleans Saints, who's a believer in Christ, had publicized something about bring your Bible to, to school week to encourage kids that are Christians to do that. And he got criticized, not surprisingly, for being outspoken about his faith in our culture. And his response, among other things, was to say that I live my life by two simple rules. And he quoted, not Fred Rogers, but Jesus. But love the Lord our God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The first place I want us to look for where that is is in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, let me just give you a little background here. The Pharisees and Sadducees were two Jewish religious leadership groups. You might think of the Pharisees as the ultra-traditionalists and conservatives, and the Sadducees as the more liberal progressives politically and theologically in that culture. And they didn't like each other, just like our day. They gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Your Bible might say, everything hangs on these. 
Everything depends on these. When my kids were little, we would ask them a series of questions at bedtime. The first was, who loves you more than the whole wide world? And we taught them the answers ahead of time. The answer was mom and dad, because I want them to know that mom and dad loved them. And then I would ask them, who loves you even more than that? And they would say, God, you know. <laughs> and then I would say, what's the most important thing in your whole life? And this took some memorization, but they quoted this. I taught them to say, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbors yourself. You know, you say these little rituals, you don't know what's getting through. My son, who is out of college now, his senior year, and he went to Wheaton College, and they would have these team chapels before every game on the football team, and each senior would have a chance to share their experience. And he quoted that bedtime saying in his senior share. And I thought, thank you, Lord. Words to live by. Commands to obey. We tend to hear this question as though he's asking what's going to be on the final, right? The, 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 the religious lawyer, and by the way, lawyer doesn't mean civil lawyer, not a Roman civil lawyer, trial lawyer. Lawyer means expert in the religious moral law of Judaism, the Old Testament. That's what kind of a law expert he is. And he says, what's the great commandment to Jesus? To test him, to trick him. And we think he's asking, like, you know, is this going to be, like, what's the minimum I have to know? You know, I would always ask that in school. Is this going to be on the test? Right? But I won't worry about it. Right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, sum it up. Give me the core, the heart of the teaching here. What does it come down to? It's a pretty important question. In Mark's account of this same exchange, Jesus tells the religious leader that because he agrees with Jesus' own answer, he says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You're close to understanding what this is all about. But the place I want to spend time exploring, really, is in the, the Gospel of Luke. Now, Luke, in Luke chapter 10, gives us a related but different account. It's not the same account, but it's the same teaching that's unpacked. In verse 25, Luke 10, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he, Jesus, said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you'll live. We'll stop there. Now, we're going to unpack what comes next, which is the famous parable of the Good Samaritan in weeks to come. But that's all we're going to deal with here this morning. There are some key differences in Luke's account, aren't there? The man's a lawyer. That's the same, an expert in the Old Testament laws of Israel. And he stands up to ask Jesus a question. Did you catch that? He stands to ask him a question. Why is that included? In our culture, the teacher stands. This is true in, in school, in college. It's true in church, right? And the learners sit. It was the reverse in Jesus' day. The rabbi teacher would sit, and the, the disciples or students would also sit, but they would stand up if they were asked to answer a question or if they had a question to ask as a sign of respect. So this man stands as a gesture of respect, but we're also told he asked the question to test him or trap him or trick him. So the point I want to make is this guy's words and his actions are not lined up with his heart. He's standing to show respect, but he's not respectful. He thinks, I'm going to expose Jesus for the fraud. I'm going to catch him in some legal trap and show that he doesn't know, he, that he's no expert to follow to all the people that are listening. But his question is what I want you to focus on. What was his question? Good teacher, what must I do? To inherit eternal life? That is an incredibly important question. In fact, it's the most important question. It's the most important question. The most important question. Well, anyway, you can write it down. <laughs> we face many important ah <laughs> we face many important questions in our lives, don't we? Should I take this job? Can I trust this girl, this guy? Should we buy this house? Should we move to this city? Will you marry me? That's a pretty important question. But there's no question more important than this question about eternal life. Life beyond this life. Life with God for all eternity. The life you're created for. John 10, 10, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly or have it to the full. What does he mean by that? We tend to interpret that on our terms happy, healthy life here and now. But the promise of life, eternal life, is the life you are made for, a life full of joy, yes, also full of sacrifice, a life that's bigger than your own desires, a life that can only be found in relationship with God. When I ask people this question, and even myself, if I ask you right now, I said, 
Where do you see your life in five years, ten years? Answer that in your own head right now. Where do you see for your life in five years? I'm going to guess most of you automatically think things like where my career will be, where we'll live, what my kids will be doing, right? Paid off this debt, be at this stage of my life. We think in terms of the here and now. Almost nobody defaults to thinking things like, I hope I know God more deeply than I know him now in five years. I want to be more gracious and generous and peaceful and patient in five years. I want to be closer to Jesus and more like him in five years. That's not our default mode. Our default mode is our circumstances. I'm not saying that's wrong. I do the same thing. But I'm just pointing out when Jesus talks about eternal life, he's not just talking about your circumstances now or five years from now. He's talking about who he made you to be in relationship with him. This is the most important question. Eternal life. How do you get this life? Can you buy it? Can you, you know, achieve it, acquire it? Can you accomplish it? How do you get it? Is it delivered by Amazon Prime? You see the trucks all over the place. Can they bring this life in a big box to your house? You know how if you search for something on, online, you get a bazillion ads for those things immediately on your, on your, on your feed? And it, it's always, I, I was looking for smart watches, and I wanted to get the expensive one, but it's too expensive, so I saw an ad for a cheap one. I thought, oh, that does the same stuff. I, well, you get what you pay for. It's true. It broke in two weeks. <laughs> That's not this life. You won't find it there. You find it only one place. Now, notice how this man phrases this question. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's really important because most of us think about religion that way, don't we? There's a, there are some things you have to do, and there's a whole bunch of things you better not do if you want God to like you, to love you, to let you in, to give you life, whatever, however you phrase it, right? That's how most of us, our default mode is in thinking about religion, religious life. Do stuff don't do stuff, get that stuff straight, and then God will, you know, not zap you or, you know, let you into heaven. But as we'll see, this is not the message of the Christian gospel, not even close. Jesus answers this guy's question with a question, which is always a good idea if you're put on the spot. Although it doesn't work if you're a student, like, taking a final. Can you imagine? Well, professor, I will also ask you a few questions, right? <laughs> doesn't work, you know. You can only do this if you're Jesus. And a little tip for us here. Don't play games with Jesus with the most important question. Let him answer it for you. Let his answer sink in. And Jesus says, I love Jesus' answer. He said, the guy says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you tell me. It's, isn't he? He says, you're the expert. You're the lawyer. How do you read it? Now, when he says, how do you read it? He's not saying, recite it all to me. He's saying, sum it up for me, break it down for me, boil it down for me, give me the essence of it. It's the same question he answered in Matthew 22. Now, a little side point here. Where does Jesus tell this religious expert to go to find the answer to his own question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus points him in wh which direction? Where? Where does Jesus say to go? Not a trick question. Where does he say to go? Right? How do you read it? What's the it? The, he says to the Old Testament, the Bible, you're the expert in the law. The phrase law and the prophets simply is a, is a Hebrew euphemism for all of the Old Testament, the scriptures as they existed to that point, the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament. He says he points him there. This is important for you. Jesus apparently thinks the place to find the best answer to the most important question is the most important book. You won't find it on Facebook. You won't find it in the self-help section or the philosophy section or the world religion section. You find it in God's word. If Jesus trusts the Bible to answer the most important questions in life, maybe we should too. And this religious leader gives a good answer, which shouldn't surprise us because he's quoting from the heart of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, this is what's referred to as the Shema, the, the center of the Jewish faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Every good and faithful Jew knew this by heart. And then he quotes Leviticus 19, verse 18, 
Also in the center of the Levitical law, the Old Testament law, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if you didn't, if you need an exclamation point, he says, I am the Lord. This is the most impossible command. It is. We'll talk about why. Jesus, think about this. Jesus says to the guy, you tell me. And the guy says, love God with all you have and love your neighbors yourself. And Jesus goes, bingo, you got it, do that. That's it. You have answered correctly. When I hear, when I hear the phrase, you have answered correctly, I think about the, uh, the, the, <laughs> where is the, the, temp, the last crusade, Indiana Jones, you know, with the old knight. You have judged poorly, right? <laughs> you have answered correctly. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, and that's okay. <laughs> but let's examine this, this, this command in more depth. Love for God. C.S. Lewis says, every Christian would agree that a person's spiritual health is exactly proportional to his or her love for God. Well, what does that mean, love for God exactly? Well, it's sort of unpacked for us in this little phrase. Love is not a static thing. Love grows over time. Love is not emotional feeling. Love expands. For example, husbands and wives, do you have a better understanding of what it means to truly love someone after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years of marriage than you did on your wedding day? Hopefully, you know more about love living in a relationship that requires it of you than you did. I remember talking to this one couple in premarital counseling who told me, we don't really need premarital counseling because we love each other so much. I'm like, that's exactly why you need <laughs> premarital counseling, right? You, we grow in our knowledge of love. Your child is born and you feel this overwhelming sense of love for your son or daughter, but you grow in what that love means as they grow. Love is not static. And it's the same with God. Love for God is not an emotional feeling you get with a certain song or once a week when you come to church. It should grow and expand and increase over time. How does that happen? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. It's the Greek word cardia, where we get our word cardiac from. It doesn't mean the blood pumping organ, nor does it mean what we mean when we say I love something with all my heart in our culture. We mean our emotions. That's not what it means in the Bible. It means your deepest affection. What you treasure most. Jesus says where your treasure is, there your what? Heart will be also. What's, what do you value most in life? Love the Lord your God that way. That you should be growing, increasing, expanding in your capacity to make God the most valuable thing in your life. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, he says. What's your soul? I, I often will ask, you know, if I ask men in the room, how's your life? They'll think my career is good, my kids are good, I got this going on, I got, they think about this stuff, right? But if I say, how's your soul? Most guys go, uh, I don't know, <laughs> what is that? The soul, the Hebrew word is the word suke, or and then uh, nefesh, the Greek word is suke. It literally means like the center of who you are, the very core of you, all encompassing. Where do you find your sense of identity and significance? So be growing and expanding and increasing and making God your greatest value and treasure and your deepest sense of identity. That's how you love God. Then he says, with all your strength. What does that mean? I really love God. Like, how do, you, how do you love God with your strength? Well, think about it. What are you striving for in life? What are you trying to grasp in life? What are you working hard for in your life? Your 401k? The retirement deadline? Your kid's success? To keep your job? To get a job? Like, what are, you, what are your energies put toward? So be growing and increasing and expanding by pursuing with your efforts love for God. What do you pour your energies into? And then he says, love the Lord your God with all your mind. What does that mean? How do you love the Lord your God with your mind? Well, it means you walk around all day going, love God, love God, love God, heavenly thoughts, heavenly thoughts, right? No. You can't love something or someone you do not know. So it means to grow in your knowledge of God. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the Apostle Paul says, Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. Transformation, life change, begins in how you think. Well, what's supposed to inform our thinking? 
Do you see a pattern here? <laughs> What's the input to be transformed, to love God with our mind? You've got all kinds of input bombarding you with all kinds of different messages. That's why it's good that I think Drew Brees said, bring your Bible to school and home from school and wherever you go. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Be renewed. A.W. Tozer said the most important thing about any of us is what comes into our minds when we think about God. Your conception of God matters. Well, how does it get formed accurately? Through his word. I've used this analogy before, but if I told you I was going to write a book about the life of Pastor Brian, you know, I think he's an important man in our culture and he deserves a biography. I'm going to write it. And he'd say, that's great. You should write that book, Pastor Jeff. And I said, but in my book, he's a seven foot five Chinese guy with red hair and freckles. He'd say, well, that's weird, and that's not him. There's, I'd say, well, that doesn't matter. That's who he is to me. That's how I like to think of him. That's ridiculous. You, I can't, there's an objective reality to who he is that you can't just make up something else. The same is true, even oh, infinitely more so with the God of the universe. There's an objective reality to who he is, and he's made that known to us. You're not free to just make up your own ideas and call it truth. You want to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind? Begin to think accurately about him by reading his word. If that wasn't hard enough, we go on, right? Think about that. We just stop there. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your greatest treasure, with all your soul, your true identity, with all your strength, your striving, with all your mind, your thoughts. Who can live up to that? But it goes further, love for neighbor. As if perfect love for God weren't challenging enough, right? But here's the thing. God, Jesus is not giving us two different commands. He's giving us one command. He's not sneaking in a second one. He's giving us one central command, which has these two facets. And one flows into the next. Your love for your neighbor is love for God. Think about this. How do you know if somebody's religion, religious? Can you observe somebody and tell if they're religious or not? Can you? Yeah, probably, right? They do religious stuff. Well, what do they do? They go to church a lot. They know a lot of Bible verses. They, uh, you know, carry a giant black Bible around. I don't know, like, what's a religious person do? You have your conception. Maybe some of your neighbors think you're religious. Maybe they don't. Maybe that's a problem. I don't know. How do you know if somebody loves God? How can you tell if somebody loves God? By what they say? The best way to know if somebody's, and it's not the only way. I can't judge your heart. I can't look and know for sure. But one of the best signs, if somebody has really been captivated by the love of God, is how they love other people, how they treat other people. Isn't this true? Isn't part of the issue we have in the church today that people do religious stuff and then act in unloving ways in the world? And the world goes, I don't want that. They look and say, I don't want that. Love for neighbor is love for God give you an illustration from my own life. When my kids were little, we had this crummy, beat-up Honda Odyssey van that we would take on family vacations. It, would, like, it, it, ro it rode forever. I missed that van now. I hated it then. Anyway. And I had this, this, like, this uh, car top carrier thing that was, in, it was a big, giant pain in the neck and other places to put on, uh, uh, to, get, to get loaded and get strapped on. And so my son would always come and want to help. Dad, I want to help you. I want to help you. And he can't reach it. He can't get up there. And I was always crabby. wanted to be alone with my irritated thoughts in the driveway loading that thing, you know. So one time I said, go help your sister. She needs help because she's like the last one to bring her stuff down. No, Dad, I want to help you. Go help your sister. But Dad, I want to help you. Listen, that is helping me. Go help your sister, right? Well, there's a sense in which we say to God, God, I want to love you more. And God says, you do? Great. Go love that guy. No, no, God, I want to love you. I'm glad you want to love me. Go serve that, that young lady. No, no, God, I, want, I just want to love you. I know you do. Here's how you can do that. Go talk to that person. Go sacrifice for that person. That is loving me. And we come to church and say, I just want to love you, God. Good. Let me tell you how, he says. Go love your neighbor. Here's a question. How do you know somebody loves God? The fish sticker on their bumper? Or how they treat the people around them? By the way, you shouldn't put those on your cars if you're going to be cutting people off in traffic. That's why, that's why I don't have one. <laughs> I do have a Chapel Street Church sticker, though. That's not good. Here's another question. 
Is your joy in any way linked to your neighbor's joy? Can I make a confession to you? Some of my neighbors who moved away, retired since so they had some misfortune in their life. And I won't get into the details, but there were some things that they did in their lives that were, you know, I stood in judgment in my heart over. And when some misfortune came, my first reaction wasn't, I want to pray for them. I feel sad for them. It was like, well, you know, that's what you get when you make these choices. That is not God's heart for those people. It may be true that our choices do produce destructive results if we make poor choices. But God's heart for them is love and compassion. And so should mine be. So should yours be. Is your joy in any way linked to your neighbor's joy? C.S. Lewis, again, in Mere Christianity about neighbor love, he writes this. You are told to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, how do you love yourself? When I look into my own mind, I find that I do not love myself by thinking myself a dear old chap or having affectionate feelings toward myself. I do not think that I love myself because I'm a particularly good person at all, but just because I am myself. I might even detest something which I have done. Nevertheless, I do not cease to love myself. In other words, the definite distinction that Christians make between hating sin and loving the sinner is one that you've been making in your own case since you were born. Love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. I, I want, that last line is really important. Love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the other person's good as far as it can be obtained a desire and a striving for someone else's good, even at cost to yourself. I have a friend who's in alcoholic recovery, and he, he's more than two decades sober, and he says, when I was in the throes of my addiction, I did not love my kids. I said, I know you loved your kids. He says, no, no, I didn't. I felt sentimental about them, but I didn't love them. Here's what he means. He said, I would come home after being out drinking for a couple of days, and I would feel guilty and ashamed, and I would stand in their bedroom door and look at them sleeping, and I would feel these deep feelings for my kids, but I wasn't loving them. Why? Because love is not how you feel in a moment. It's a steady wish and working for the other person's good, regardless of how you feel in a moment. That is love. Love for God is not feeling certain things now and then. Love for God is the steady pursuit of his ultimate good and glory. And then love for neighbor is the same, regardless of how you feel. If you wait till you feel like it, you're, gonna, you're not going to do it. Married people in the room, what if you only acted loving toward your spouse when you felt loving toward them? <laughs> Some of you are like, that's what you do now, right? <laughs> you wouldn't have a very good marriage. Your heart follows your actions, not the other way around. Jesus is taking us out of the realm of theoretical by telling us to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's one thing to say, I believe in love for fellow man and, and peace on earth and, and, you know, that's all theoretical and good. But when it becomes specific, love your neighbor, that person, as yourself. Love your immigrant neighbor. Love your neighbor who has less than you. Love your neighbor who's a different skin color than you. Love your neighbor who's a Democrat or a Republican. Oh, no, not that. Jesus can't mean that. Well, I don't know. It's not in here, but I think he does. It becomes harder, doesn't it? It's not theory then. Love your neighbor as yourself. Frederick Dale Bruner in his commentary on this passage says, a neighbor minimizing love of God is just as reprehensible to Jesus as a God minimizing love of neighbor. You have to have both. You have to have both. Now here's my experience as a pastor. When we start talking about sound doctrine, right theology, thinking accurately about God being anchored in the truth, conservative people get really excited. Yes, amen, the truth. And liberal people get a little nervous. When you start talking about justice, compassion, mercy, and care for the poor, liberal people get very excited. Yes. And conservative people go, yeah, yes, but where's this going? Is it, have you observed that in the world or in the church? What is Jesus saying? Yes and amen to both. You must have love for God based on who God is in his word and love for neighbor. One without the other is not Christian. In fact, one without the other, if you have one without the other, you have neither, Jesus says. These are inextricably linked in our lives. We must have both. 
And here's what makes this command possible. Which of us can keep it? Which of us can keep this? I can't. The best I can do is a couple hours at home with my kids not flying off the handle, right? Who can perfectly love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and love your neighbor, all your neighbors as yourself? That's impossible. Here's another question. What good is an impossible command? What good is a command that nobody can keep? What's the point of that? Just to make us all feel bad and guilty all the time? Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, the Apostle Paul says that the law, the commandments were given to be your tutor or your guardian until Christ came, that you might be justified in him. That's why, that's what good the command is. To show you your inadequacy and your need apart from Christ. To bring you to your knees, to cry out for his forgiveness and mercy, that you might receive his neighboring love for you. To set you free from guilt and condemnation and to send you out into the world. So we strive to love God with all that we are and our neighbor as ourself. And when we inevitably fail, where do we go with that? Right to the cross, to Jesus. This is the most incredible Savior. Romans 10 verse 4 says that he's the end of the law. He's the reason the law was given. It all is pointing to him. The most important question, how do I get this life, is Jesus says, well, be perfect. (laughs) That's impossible. But there's one who was for you. Here's how this works. I'm going to say it briefly, then we're going to celebrate by coming to the table. When you trust Jesus, and I know many of you know this, but I don't think all of you know this all of the way. And even if you do, Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 that I'm going to remind you of these things as long as I live. So many of us need to be reminded. Here's how this works. When you trust in Jesus Christ for forgiveness, three things happen simultaneously. Number one, your past record is forgiven. That's the cross and the shed blood. It's paid for. It's gone. It's not held against you. We hold stuff against each other and bring it back up again. God does not do that. It's gone. Number two is that we're told that we get Christ's record of righteousness. There's only one who kept the law and the commandments, and it wasn't you or me. It was him. And so when you trust in him, your past is forgiven, and his record of perfect obedience is now yours. It's credited to your account. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see all your screw-ups. He sees the perfection of his son. That's why he can call you my beloved. And number three, we're told the spirit of God comes into our minds and our hearts and begins to enable us to live and obey in ways we couldn't without him. Isn't that good news? It's such good news. It's not this impossible command to keep. We trust the one who paid for our disobedience, was obedient for us, and who gives us his spirit to enable us to love him and love our neighbor. That's what the table is about. So here's how we'll close. This doesn't matter. This is not our table. It's not Chapel Street's table. It's the table of Jesus. So if you're here, whether you're a member, regular tender, or here for the first time, if you know Christ as Lord and Savior, forgiver, you are welcome at his table. That's between you and the Lord. In a moment, you'll, the trays will be passed. You'll find two cups stacked together. Grab them, hold them both in your hands, and after we've all been served, I'll come back up and lead us through taking of the elements. Because this table symbolizes God's great neighboring love for you and for me. The price he paid. Let's bow. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us what we don't deserve, what we cannot earn. We have no hope of achieving But because you love us, while we are still sinners, you love us and die for us and rose from the grave for us. It's beyond our comprehension, Lord. Now, as we prepare our hearts to receive again these simple reminders, bread and cup of your body and your blood, speak the words of grace, forgiveness, mercy, and love we need and long to hear. We pray this in your name.